Okay, welcome. I'm Tim Skigans, Chairman of the Shaftesbury Select Board, and I'm calling this meeting of the Shaftesbury Select Board to order at 6.30 on Monday, October 16th, 2017. <coughs> First, I need to ask, does any member of the board have a conflict of interest with anything appearing on the agenda this evening? I have no. not. No. no? Okay, good. Uh, first up, approval of minutes. We have minutes that were circulated for our meeting on October 2nd. Motion to approve. Motion to approve from Art. Second. Second by Ken. Any additions, corrections, or discussion on the minutes from October 2nd? Uh, just the correction of spelling of both of them. In fact, somebody highlighted it. Yeah. Okay. What is the we correct saw that spelling? We printed that out to yeah. the It's B O U D. O-I-N, I think. Yeah, O-I-N, that's correct, man. Okay. Any other changes? All in favor of approving the minutes for October 2nd as corrected, say aye. 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 Abstaining. Abstaining is uh, Tony. He was not there. So that vote passes 4-0-1. Next up is warrants. Oh, let me uh, do what I should have done at this top. I was gonna. I was thinking about um, Stephanie Land is here from Shires Housing to talk about uh, an issue with that project in Parent Acres. Um, I first thought we would have her speak in public comments. It's kind of an. It really is an economic development ish issue. Yes. We have a big economic development uh, session on the agenda, so I was thinking she could speak at the first of that. So without objections, we'll change the agenda to have uh, Stephanie speak during the economic development part of the agenda. Okay. Okay. So then warrants. First up, I have check warrant number the, number 11 in the amount of $73,109.47. So much. Motion to approve from Tony. Second. Second by Art. Items over $1,000 here we have uh, Buck Hill Road, LLC, $1,500. That's renting the property from the back. Oh, right. Okay. <coughs> uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield for $3,300. Endine. For twenty-five hundred dollars. That was the water testing at the landfill. Okay. Uh, Fifty-four hundred dollars to Goldstone Architecture for no doubt services related to mm -hmm. the garage. Eleven hundred dollars to KAS. That would be our regular. No, that would be the development of our new uh, operations plan for the transportation in the uh, not the transportation the landfill. Uh, because of the PFOAs, we had to develop a new plan to submit to the state, and that's for the, that's for okay. the engineering bill to develop that. Uh, MSK Engineering and Design, 31000 That's pretty much the final payment for the design, civil design process for the uh, garage. Okay. And moving the transfer station. Okay. Uh, 1400 to New England Municipal Resource. That's uh, Nimerick, the computer system that we Nimerick. all okay, operate on. Okay, I see on. it now. Yes. <laughs> Don't know that I ever saw it spelled out before. Yeah, it's a, yeah. It's, it seems much more official. That way. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's several here, even one that's close to a thousand from Southworth Milton Inc. That's all parts for, for the tractors oh, okay. and the cats. Okay. Uh, 1200 to Urban Car Care. Yeah, the water department truck needed quite a bit of work. So. And then several for William E. Daly, uh, 2900, 3600, 4900, 5300. That's chloride and, and shoulder stone and materials for the roads. Right. Mm -hmm. We need plenty of that. Any more discussion on check warrant number 11? All in favor of approving check warrant 11 say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? 
Check warrant number 11 in the amount of $73,109.47 is approved, 500. Okay, this is the special one you were telling me about. Check yeah. warrant number 10 in the amount of $80. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Moved by Tony. Second. Second by Art. Uh, David was informing, that, informing me that we had to have a, uh, a license fee sent to the state in a hurry for Dave Worthington's water department license. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 So check warrant number 10 in the amount of $80 is approved, 500. Okay. And payroll warrant number 7 in the amount of $19,708.21. Motion to approve from Tony. Second. Second by Art. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That motion is approved. Uh, let's see, the motion that's payroll warrant number seven in the amount of $19,708.21 is approved, 500. <coughs> Good. <coughs> hey, Alice. Okay. Uh, that takes care of warrants. Are there any announcements? <coughs> I'll have a quick one to thank the sheriff for his quick response and putting a radar sign out by the school here. I only asked them last Thursday for extra patrols and assistance with the speed, and uh, the sign was out there today. So that's pretty nice. We appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on that subject, uh, I was having my car worked on the other day at Urban and talking to Karen about. Uh, the traffic there, and uh, they will tell you there that uh, cars and trucks are just screaming down seven all the time. So we need to probably come up with some sort of directed plan for the sheriff that divides their time between patrols and traffic control, not only here on Buck Hill, but also on 7A, because as soon as we stop looking, people are oh, yeah. driving 45 miles an hour again. That's the thing, when they were uh, enforcing it, you know, people would go to a, you know, the 25 mile hour limit. I noticed that myself. And then mm -hmm. uh, when they do uh, take some time away from it, you know, people like that, yeah, like if they're all done, you know, so they go right. back to yeah. speeding up. And it's, yeah, seeing somebody get a ticket will slow a lot of people down for a while. So unfortunately, we have to do that from time to time. Any public comments? No? Okay, item seven is always. Treasurer's report with Melanie Dexter. Okay, go. And let's see. Did that go to the Dropbox today? Dropbox in the morning. Okay, I forgot to grab it. Let me do that. No, not that one. very little to say that I haven't said a million times. <laughs> okay. um, this is my time of year for taxes, as you can see. Uh, that's just this month. I've been pretty busy. It's, uh, it's just processing checks all the time these days. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. um, we're in, in good shape. We're not going to have to do any more draws on the line of credit. Um, if you want to, there's nothing unusual here. We got the, uh, the state aid is, is a regular payment. Um, Nothing else unusual going on in receipts. Um, if you want to go down, uh, I started. I always list the other funds as of this date. You see that I'm um, including the garage bond now, so you'll see that. Um, oh, okay, good. As that's the money that's in the uh, U.S. bank, mm -hmm. so it's already earned a little bit of interest for us because we haven't spent anything from it. Mm -hmm. But I think there's going to be um, money coming out from yes, this warrant, very quickly, right? Yes. 
after this warrant's approved, we're going to total them all up, and yeah. uh, it'll be So then I'll do my first draw, and I, I, I think I, I know what is involved. I haven't done it yet, but it's, it's a little bit of paperwork, but it, it'll be second nature pretty soon. Um, I also started putting, just for this season, uh, taxes received to date and percentage of total. So that's, that's telling you how bad my next few weeks will be. But uh, <laughs> it's nice that we've got almost 15% in already. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, and I, I love to see people spreading it out, as I've said before. If you don't wait for November 9th, you will not be happy with the lines. Uh, so that's all I have to say. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, nothing else for Melanie? All right, thank you, Melanie. Thank you. Sure. Okay, road foreman report. The road foreman can't be with us this evening. Uh, he has a, a appointment. Um, basically, the only real change is been a lot of grading roads are being prepared. The big uh, last big project was uh, prep today is doing the, the uh, Couple thousand feet of Shaftesbury Hollow fabric and a regravel project is staked out today. That's going to start Wednesday in full. Uh, the road will be operational the whole time. There could be some delays. Uh, we have rented uh, some equipment from a local contractors and an operator to help uh, move the project along. It's we feel it'll take uh, five days in total to do it. It's it's a bit larger than we originally planned. Other than that, we'll be back to uh, getting the tr trucks ready for winter and uh, continuing to get the roads ready for winter. Uh, there will only be one other uh, project after that, and that is Trumbull Hill. Uh, we've had to put that off a little bit, but we sh still should be able to do it. And that road will be closed, so when we get to that, uh, we'll notify everybody in the bus company that it will be closed for about eight hours a day. Uh, hopefully it can be done in a day, but. Uh, we're digging down the side of the road to channel a, a spring that's in the middle of the road off to the side using using basically a French drain. Uh, but there's also a ledge there, which is one reason why the spring is running there. So if we hit ledge, then we have a whole different problem and we might just have to seal it up and wait to the spring because that'll be a much larger project. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. That'll probably be picked up uh, depending on weather, which is finally good. Uh, maybe we can do that the end, towards the end of next week. And then the rest is all winter prep and everything. The salt prices are in. They're going to be around 72 probably for this year. And uh, we're getting the sand. The sand now is coming from right over here, so we're not going to have a huge mountain in the back anymore. We'll mix us a good portion to get ready, and uh, they'll come back. And the only other holdup right now is our cylinder still isn't on the truck, and it's still sitting in Albany. And... Uh, from Delores and Kaiser and everybody else, it's waiting on this part to arrive. And to me, it's incomprehensible. But they also have us over a barrel. The trucks there, and the parts on the way. And uh, you know, winter's coming. We'd like to get this finished with. Mm -hmm. uh, and the rest of it, uh, everything's uh, falling into place for the winter. So we should be good. So the Shaftesbury Hollow project, that was a five-day project. Yes. It's going to cost about what, seventy thousand. That was seventy thousand dollars. And yeah. that included the the contract. That yeah. Yeah, okay. we always plan to. Uh, we always have to rent a vibratory roller because we don't have one. We thought we'd move the project along and uh, make the application of materials smoother if we rented a bulldozer with an operator. Uh, we finally confirmed one today, so he'll be there Wednesday morning at 7:30. Um, basically, what it comes down to is the other holdup was we don't have enough trucks to do this, so we've been waiting for Peckham's to have enough crews available. Uh, but because paving is so backed up this year, we keep getting put off. It's all, it's all a matter of running the loads from here to the hollow and keeping a good rhythm to keep everything moving. You know, you can't have too many arrive at one time. Everybody gets in everybody's way. So it's, you hope the timing comes out uh, right. And it is, for a loaded triaxle, that's kind of a long run over to the end of Shaftesbury Hollow on these roads. So, uh, but five days should be more than enough to finish it. Hopefully at minimal inconvenience, although there will be some. It's a narrow road and uh, there will be some inconvenience, but come mud season, we'll have a dry road. So, and I think that might be about it for... Okay. Good. 
<coughs> Any more talk on roads? Did we get our mulcher? Oh, no, the, the mulcher we're buying will probably won't come to the spring because that's on a grant. The grant's been submitted. We're, we're going to get the grant. But uh, we are mulching tomorrow, uh, the, last, the last round. Uh, we're going to blow the ditches out. We've done because the leaves are coming down. And uh, we have to get something on it for the winter just to, to get it growing and stabilize it. So we'll finish that up tomorrow and then go right into Wednesday to get the hollow. Uh, we couldn't get any trucks for tomorrow. That's why we didn't, we're not doing, couldn't get them for today and we can't get them for tomorrow. So uh, Wednesday was the first day where we were able to get, finally get three triaxles. It'd be better to have four, but you know, three will do to get it going. Just so you know, I got yelled at by my wife today because the crew didn't uh, see the ditch that they cleared out in front of our house uh, two years ago. Tomorrow. I told her, uh, <laughs> I told her we're getting a machine to do that. That's right. So we better get that machine. All right, we better, we better. Or I'll be in trouble. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that is a problem. Part of the whole thing, uh, especially with the new regulations, is all this has to be done. And, and the manual method is, is ridiculous. So we rented it from Brown F. Browns again, the mulch we used last time. And we will mulch everything we've done in a day, uh, whereas it could take days the other way. And with the grant we, we received, uh, you know, we'll be mulching these much quicker in the future. You know, it stabilizes the ditch, the whole point of it, so, uh, yeah, but some had gotten behind. Okay, um, we, uh, we had kind of a light agenda, it's starting to look kind of foolish now, but uh, I thought we would revisit some economic development issues that I've been spending a lot of my time on and make sure that they're always in the mind of the select board. Uh, related to that, um, Stephanie Lane from the director of Shires Housing is uh, with us tonight and wanted to bring to our attention uh, an issue with the planned uh, or the, the parent acres development that Shires Housing is working on. So um, Stephanie, if you'd like to come up and tell us what's, uh, what's going on there. Because that does certainly relate to economic development, since it's <laughs> some of the only economic development happening in Shasbury <laughs> these days. Well, thank you for having me. Um, so, I don't know how much you know about Shire's housing, but our mission is to provide safe, decent, and perpetually affordable housing to residents of Bennington County. Um, and we've been involved with a lot of projects lately. We've been pretty busy. Um, Applegate was the last construction project that we completed. Uh, we had the ribbon cutting last week, in fact, and that included a massive biomass boiler plant, and that was a very exciting project. Um, we're also working on the Batten Kill North project. Uh, two of the buildings are located here in Shaftesbury, 1930 and 1956, Route 67, so the twin brick houses. So those are part of our next development that's underway. Um, so, you know, we, we have a lot going on. We do uh, contribute a lot in terms of economic development to the communities that we serve. <coughs> and the proposed Lake, Villain, Lake Village, Lake Perrin Village project, sorry, um, has been before you before. I gave you a brief overview of it a while ago. Um, so it's a proposed 22-unit multifamily <coughs> development on Perrin Road, um, right near McCarthy Acres. It's um, designed to be rather compact, and it has a few acres set aside for conservation. Uh, the way it's proposed right now, the site plan includes four buildings. So it looks like um, sister farmhouses. Uh, we try to tie it to the neighborhood where it's going to be built. It is on the lower edge of the site, the largest building, so that it's not visible from the lake on the other side. So we're trying to be you know, very aware of the town and what the town's needs and wants will be. Uh, we anticipate the investment will be about $6.3 million, and that's where it stands right now, and those things do change depending on how long we're hauled up. Some of the funders would include VHFA, VHCB, uh, the Federal Home Loan Bank of Boston, um, NEF is the equity provider, uh, which is unusual for this area. They've only done one project in the whole state of Vermont, so that would be rather exciting to bring them to this, this part of the country. It's uh, the one state that they have trouble breaking into, I guess, is, is what they've told me. Um, so my request this evening is regarding water. So that's a big missing ingredient in this project. We can't move forward unless we have water. Um, 
We have limited capacity in the town of North Bennington, as I'm sure you know, um, due to the PFOA crisis. And what we're here to determine is perhaps if the town of Shaftesbury um, has any additional capacity that is unrestricted at this time that they might be able to allocate to a project such as this. Um, we, this is the one thing that's sort of holding us up and could be the make or break, of course, for the project. Um, we, we have a lot invested in the pre-development and we get to a point where if we think, you know, we may have to wait, then we have to stop the investment that the company is making in the endeavor until we're sure that it's going to make sense to continue um, and, and water is a huge part of this. So our, our current estimate, uh, based on what Jason from MSK Engineering has worked up for us, is about 5,400 GDP, GDP on this right now. And that's gone down from where we originally stood. Um, we've reduced some of the square footage to help cut costs. We're at about 17,600 square feet of residential space for the project in total. So that's helped to reduce it. That's one way we usually tackle it first. And um, so that's... That's something I just wanted to inquire about as we've hit some walls in, in trying to make this work and we're still dedicated to this project <coughs> to bringing workforce housing here to Shaftesbury and thought I would present this and see what the board thought about this since you're, you're somewhat familiar with the project. Yes, um, Chris sent me an email um, giving me a heads up about the, the issues you've run into. It's, it's, okay. uh, it is concerning because, uh, like I say, it's a... Uh, it's a, a big development in Shaftesbury that we're, we're hopeful for. And um, as I will be talking about in the economic development section, workforce housing is a big issue that's been identified in the Southern Zone report as holding uh, all of Southern Vermont back in terms of economic development. So uh, it's something we really want to try and figure out how to make work. Uh, but to, to be honest, uh, I don't think very many of us here know, you probably know more about the procedure for getting, getting water than any of us because there have not been any new uh, requests for hookups to municipal water since I've been here that I'm aware of. Uh, so maybe you could tell us what, what steps you've gone through and, and what the result of well, that was so far. Thus far I've been to the North Bennington village to, to to make this request and what they have told me is that they have to ensure that all residents of North Bennington who may need to do a, a public hookup who are currently on wells and who may have contamination they have to reserve any allotment even though they do seem to have the capacity uh, at this point they're hesitant to grant it to anyone outside of the town of, or the village of North Bennington and this project is in fact in Shaftesbury. So that's been the concern and I can understand that they want to serve the residents first and that's where their duty lies in this. So, you know, the PFOA crisis continues um, and it, it right. continues to have impact. So yeah, that's why we thought perhaps if you, you know, had an allocation that you hadn't utilized that there might be I'm not, something. I'm not aware of that we're allocated. I mean, we buy our water from North Bennington. Mm -hmm. So if they say they're concerned, then I, I, they do not allow us to have so much. It's usually that I'm aware Yeah, of. I mean, it's, it's uh, I mean, to a, uh, a significant degree, it's a customer vendor relationship. We buy water from them. Mm -hmm. um, there is a partnership. I mean, the plant sets in on Shaftesbury land. Uh, the water, by and large, is uh, water that's collected flowing through Shaftesbury, uh, but it's their plant that they run, and we buy buy water from them. And we got two conflicting reports from um, from Joe about whether new hookups would be allowed or not. Um, so we don't know um, sure. uh, whether we can in fact hook up. But when you, when this project came forward, mm -hmm. that was one of the biggest questions that we had, was where are you going to get your water from? Right. That right. would have and to be North Bennington. Yeah, it wasn't a no, it was a not now. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. but, but there was no, you know, in, in trying to get a date or sort of a deadline, there, yeah. there wasn't one offered. Yeah. So somebody has that answer for you, whether you can, in fact, hook on to that system or not. 
And North Bennington's giving you the runaround on that? Well, they, they have said not right now because they just need to serve their own at this point, you know, their residents and make that the priority. So, uh, yeah. I don't think we certain. have any lines within a mile of that no. site. No, our lines end at Twitchell Hill. That's what I thought. All right. All right. See, I mean, everything served down there is served from North Bennington Water Company. Right. Right. The only way we could do it is to build a line there, which is a long way. Well, you are going to go through that swamp. You're going to go there. You but then we would, have to ask, we would have to ask yeah. North they're Bennington they're for the allocation that they've already said they don't want to give up. Oh. Okay. The only, has anybody ever talked about Bennington and North Bennington hooking on to each other? Because they come awful close to go. I think <coughs> if you go down the end of Water Street, and I think Bennington comes over through past the paper mill, whether they have ever talked about hooking on, and then you'd have all the capacity you'd want for a while. But that's the only. Well, again, yeah, part thing. of this North Bennington is is building uh, towards you know North Bennington to make hookups to a lot of those houses. That's right. So they're actually getting closer. Maybe there is a connection because I know other water systems have connected to bigger ones. Maybe maybe that's the solution. If they can get a hub connected to Bennington. You really would have all the water you could ask for. Okay, yep. that's that's what I would pursue to see if there's any talk of that. Yeah, um, you know, all we can offer at this time is to to look into it. Um, I can certainly talk to Steve Goodrich, the, the chairman of the Bennington Water Department, and see you know exactly what his what pressures he's feeling to <coughs> to reserve water for the. PFOA victims there, and it's certainly understandable that they would have that mm -hmm. uh, concern. Um, just thinking out loud, is there any possibility of this project going forward with well water? We don't think so, no. Especially considering the issues mm -hmm. that they're having there. Yeah, we we would rather do a public cookout. Yeah. Chris. When the Planning Commission investigated an expansion of the village residential district, we, we spent a lot of time talking to the Shaftesbury Water Department mm -hmm. because the issue was capacity to expand, you know, multiple residential development. And uh, Joe Herman, who was then the superintendent of the water, said that we had capacity for about 30 more residences. Uh, this is what, 24 units? 22. 22 units. So, uh, I don't know. I mean, the number didn't seem completely solid to me, but what's behind it? You know, the, there was a sense that there, there was capacity that was somehow dedicated to Eagle Square that was sitting unused year after year, decade after decade, and that, you know, it would support increased residential consumption. No, that's an idea that I hadn't thought of, is Eagle Square at some time, I'm sure, was using tons of water that they're not anymore, and if that's still being held in reserve for them, that might be a source of allocation that we could investigate because there's not a lot of, act, not nearly the activity there that there were a while ago. What is, uh, how old is that information from Joe that we had capacity for 30 more road houses? Four years ago, maybe. Okay. okay. We could never get anything in writing. That, no. That was one of the things that worried me. You know, I surprised. think that's just the way it operated. I'm not, I'm not surprised. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, if I can suggest, we're about due for a water board meeting. Why don't we schedule it for our, before our next select board meeting and hash this out with the water department? Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, I answer for you. Um, <laughs> so I think that's where where we are with it right now. Is we can look into it, see what we can see what we can find. No, I, I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. Okay. 
So, um, on the subject of uh, economic development uh, a little further, um, as I mentioned before to the board, we, uh, we've asked, uh, I asked, uh, with knowledge from the board, the Planning Commission to look into the feasibility of bringing back the country store, not really knowing what I was asking, but just the idea that uh, when the country store left, there were a lot of people that were, were upset about that. It was really kind of the heart of the town, and it, when it left, uh, we kind of felt like we didn't have a place that was Shaftesbury anymore. And since then, I've read an, uh, an article or two in a magazine or two about different towns that have uh, revitalized their country stores by community effort and asked the Planning Commission to look into whether or not there's anything we can do. And um, they spent a good bit of time on it, produced a report, and they're here to re tell us about that now. Chris? Thank you, Tim. Well, I think that... Uh, I have uh, copies of the report I can hand <coughs> Okay, and I can bring it up on the uh, oh, screen here also. Thank you. Uh, there you go. Well, uh, quite briefly, the Planning Commission looked at three different sites that were available presently that could be developed. And we looked at case studies of how other communities had dealt with this problem where failed country stores had been brought back to life. And so in the report, the stories of Putney, West Townsend, and um, what was the last one? Uh, Hubbardton? No, the J. J. not Hubbardton. Well, Peru with the J.J. Hapgood country store, what was the other one? Hancock, which is a little town on Route 100 up by Rochester. Um, so these stories are instructive in the sense of kind of what model they chose and how they financed it and what the public process <coughs> was to make this happen. And also was an analysis of what's available in the village. And so we looked at three properties, the present country store property, the building across the street, the Madison building, which had been a country store in uh, in li I say in the report, in living memory, because I can remember it, <laughs> and um, the bank building around the corner, which is owned by uh, Jim Secor. And uh, we thought all these had potential, none of them are perfect, they all have drawbacks, they all have pluses and minuses. Um, and so just reviewing it quickly, the present location, has uh, two apartments above, has a pretty ample square footage for merchandising and economic activity. And um, the two apartments could provide cash flow to support the business. So those are the pluses, the minuses are Parking is atrocious at that location. It requires backing out into Route 7A, which is a no-no. Uh, it's inadequate. The loading facilities are inadequate. And the septic, we, we found evidence of a 1,500-gallon septic system, but, you know, word on the street was it had failed. And uh, this lot is ridiculously small for the amount of building it supports. There's no room to expand anything. So those are the minuses. Um, across the street, the Madison building was a country store. And the laundromat later, um, it, you know, it, it's a handsome building, uh, pretty unutilized, not particularly 
in great condition. There would be a lot of expense in fitting up the building, code compliance issues. Um, the square footage is actually bigger than the present country store building, a little bit bigger. But again, a lot is very constrained. Parking is a problem. Separate expansion wouldn't really be possible as far as we can see. So, you know, the parking might be solved by renting space from an adjacent property. Septic, I don't see any hopes for expansion there. What, can I ask a question? I mean, Peter Cross has concerns that, you know, they wouldn't be able to handle the increased load a business would produce, but it used to be a laundromat. I remember that myself. But it also failed. It did. That's why, that's why it is no laundromat. The, okay, I, mean, I don't understand it, that. It came, it came okay. to the surface. <laughs> okay, it was yeah, it's a good time to stop. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh gosh, yes. Okay, yeah, all right, well, you know, that would be pretty septic intensive. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not too surprised that uh, Ken Harrington put the system in. I did that. <laughs> <laughs> He's got your number again. Oh, that's true. I know he's dead, but he's Anyway, uh, the third property is the uh, former Bank of Bennington building around the corner on Church Street. Um, the building is 1,500 square foot. It's too small for what's envisioned, but the lot is 1.1 acre and it could, you know, a substantial addition could be added. and. That would be the obvious place to deal with a commercial kitchen. Um, and <clears throat> parking could be expanded and septic could be expanded, but the complication is the driveway to the post office. And so that would have to be reorganized to make this possible. All these things are within the realm of possibility. Um, building's been for sale for a bunch of years. Um, it doesn't have root seven a exposure, but build it and they will come. I think so. We think it's a viable candidate for this. Um, I wouldn't rank them. All of them have pluses and minuses. Take your pick. Which pluses and minuses you want to bite onto? In terms of case studies, we saw a whole variety of situations in the Putney General Store. Uh, Putney has gone through unbelievable situations to maintain their country store when a fire burned it down about 10 years ago. The village rallied and raised a million dollars to buy the property and rebuild the store. Uh, country, the um, Historical Society became a proprietor uh, as they were just on the verge of reopening their rebuilt store. It was burned to the ground a second time by arson and they rallied and, and took the insurance money and rebuilt it again and opened the thing and a few months later they proprietor who they had leased the operation to died of cancer and all of a sudden they, they didn't have an operator. The Historical Society stepped up and operated the store with their own people and volunteers and uh, they've gotten a new proprietor and things seemed to have kind of stabilized for them but it was a long ordeal. But the village was determined that they were going to have a country store and so you know, this this is what public support can do. West Townsend is an interesting case study in that it's a tiny, tiny village. It's seven miles from the main Townsend village. It's kind of isolated along the West River. Um, and because of community involvement, they've reopened their country store and paired it with uh, commercial prep kitchen for local food production, uh, a post office, a thrift store, and uh, 
a lot of community activities. And so again, this is a story of community support making this thing possible. There's a farmer's market there in the summer months as well. And so, I mean, this village is so much smaller than Shaftesbury. It's really amazing to see this thing. And um, so, you know, it just says that if the community is behind you and you make the right choices in terms of kind of how you draw people to the enterprise, you can do this sort of thing. Um, and then Hancock is more of the traditional model of a mom and pop enterprise, uh, enterprising family in town. Oh, I should talk about J.J. Hapgood. Um, well, when Jim Sullivan of the BCRC talked to us about this, <coughs> he said, well, he said, well, what you want is rich people who want to have a country store who have deep pockets. And I think J.J. Hapgood might be a case study of, of that. So in that sense, it, the what the report doesn't say is that the building of the new facility <coughs> was over a million dollars. And that probably is not applicable to our situation here in Shaftesbury. But, you know, just, this uh, is if I could interrupt just so people get their bearings, it's in Peru. 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 I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. Bromley. So it's in Peru Village. Again, a tiny village, much, much smaller than Shaftesbury. Um, it, uh, it's very attractive facility and the community rallied behind it, even though it was privately owned. Somebody in the community donated Dorset marble for the patio out front and the area where outdoor dining takes place. And, you know, it's a combination of general store, um, deli, prepared foods, uh, Vermont products, Vermont artwork, uh, I don't know. Uh, it's a very kind of creative place. Uh, food is good and the ambiance is nice. Um, it might be a little rich for our blood. That's, that's an economic model. Um, so I said to talk about Hancock. Um, that, that was a general store resuscitated by an enterprising couple that owned already established businesses in this. Again, it was a very, Hancock's a very small village. And um, they poured themselves into revitalizing this uh, failed general store. And um, they've got, you know, the, the ingredients seem to be similar in a lot of these enterprises, and they involve not just the classic general store merchandise, but prepared food, grab-and-go food you can walk out the door with, whether it's your lunch, your dinner, whatever, um, and emphasis oftentimes on local produce. Uh, that's true at J.J. Hapgood and Hancock, uh, well, and, and West Townsend, and uh, seating, cafe seating. Sit down and, and eat it right there. And Vermont artwork, craft products, uh, Vermont beer in some cases is an ingredient in the, in, in, in the economic mix. Uh, up north, especially, this seems to be more prevalent. A lot of the breweries are mostly up north. And uh, so we think that uh, maybe the classic model has to be updated for the 21st century, but there's opportunity, especially if you have community support. Now, one of the questions we raise in the report is since the demise of the country store, the uh, market wagon over here on in Bennington on Route Six on uh, Route Seven A has become a major business. Uh, it taps into the same market that the country store would tap into. So the question is: Are we looking at a situation of saturation between Paulins and the market wagon? Is there enough market 
to support a country store. The, the, the problem is, you look at the country, the, the, the market wagon, they have excellent parking, easy in and out, even though there's been some skid marks and crashes up there, but still. Pollen's the same thing, easy in and out. The country store here, yeah. you can't. Well, it's, the country store might be any of the three properties we talk about, and mm -hmm. they don't all have that same liability, but your point is well taken. Yeah. I mean, it becomes an issue. Back in the day, I mean, that key element didn't exist because the, the store really survived off from the people who inhabited the area. Um, it wasn't like outsiders coming in. They didn't depend on that when the Harringtons owned it and when I was a kid growing up. I mean, it was always busy and uh, parking didn't seem to be a big problem. Now, when Kevin and Tracy uh, galley on the, the country store, the last, a lot of times I would want to go to the country store and I couldn't because there was no place to park. So I'd go to Pollens. You know, it's simple as that. And, and, and I know a lot of people like to congregate outside and drink coffee. So that's the community thing to do. And I, you know, I think that's great. But what happens is, you know, for what a cup of coffee costs, it's really costing the store a lot of customers because people are just driving by. And then they're plugging up all the parking spots, you know, just hanging out and drinking coffee. If I was a store owner, I'd be like, you know, geez, you know, can you move along? <laughs> but but that, that, I think that, that really, that was the kiss of death for that store. It was just the parking. Yeah, park is terrible. We should yeah, not yeah. report. It'll make you or break you. It's, yeah. um, so, uh, I would I would add one thing that's not in the report, and that is that you know, as Tim gave us the task to look at this, one of the things that he emphasized was a, a gathering place for Shaftesbury, and I would point to the model of the. Shaftesbury Community Club up in my neighborhood in northern Shaftesbury as a community funded gathering place. This is a country church that was donated to the community back in the early 40s, <coughs> maintained by the community, and goes through ups and downs depending on who's managing it and what sort of program is being put forward. But um, it's in an upswing at the moment, and you can hardly, when there's a community supper at this place, you can hardly get in the door. You better come early. So the idea of something that is a community gathering spot that is not a commercial enterprise, that's community supported, might be another avenue to look at in this regard, if, if that's an important consideration that you know, we do have a lot of empty buildings, and um, they could be repurposed for something like this. Why it might even be able to happen at Cole Hall, uh, since the community club in my neighborhood has very little kitchen facilities, and everything arrives pre-cooked and ready to put on the table and share. So, you know, that model is has proven to endure over my lifetime. I've been going there since I was a young kid. And so that might be a, another avenue to think about. Well, the one thing that could save the country store here in town would be to buy the property that's, that's adjo adjoined to it, that blue house out back. They own that property out front in the corner. If they could buy that house, if it ever went up for sale, <laughs> well, then you could have a parking lot. And then you could also have an outside eatery, well, things like that. You, you have to weigh that building against what else you could do at another site. Mm -hmm. You know, just because that's been a country store for 100 years doesn't mean it's the right place to have a country store. Oh, I, I understand that. It sounds like you're talking more about um, some place to have like lunch and breakfast as opposed to a store that's well I don't store. know you know the, we can't design a business for some no. entrepreneur who right. hasn't been identified they'll design the business yeah. we're just looking at what other people have done and what we see working in other parts of the sure. state sure. and so you know yeah can you buy Sorel boots can you get fencing tools can you get but, but know, are these small grassy? stores that you're, you're talking about, are they in the same situation as some of the stores we have here? With no parking. 
again, if you don't have parking, you're not going <laughs> well, to do well. Well, you know, I don't know what the parking in Hancock is. Yep. I just don't know. Yep. But all I'm saying is that people have seen their country stores go down mm -hmm. and have revived them. And, you know, we looked at what models were used. And uh, we think that, you know, prepared food is an important component. The ability to sit down mm -hmm. and yeah. eat it there is important. Uh, you know, think about the, the places around here. I mean, my favorite country store is H.N. Williams Department Store in South Dorset. You can go in there and you can buy cow feed, you can buy fencing tools, you can buy, you know, winter boots, you can buy a kerosene lamp, you can buy a deli sandwich. Uh, you know, uh, it's been there for over a hundred years. They keep adapting. That might be the key to the whole thing. <coughs> well, um, as I said, this effort came out of the fact that a lot of people came to me wanting to know, you know, what can we do to bring back this, the country store? And as I've been involved in a lot of uh, economic activity uh, meetings and such related to the Southern Zone stuff, I started to ask myself what could happen, what could be done. And since I didn't know the answer, I went to the Planning Commission to see what could be done. And um, as it says here in their, uh, one of their final general thoughts there, um, the, the retail revival example cited in this report were all powered by community involvement. And while there is anecdotal evidence that the loss of the country store was mourned by many, Shaftesbury has yet to see similar homegrown effort to bring it back. I have to agree. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, what the story is, is there's not a lot that we can do here as a, as a select board, except, you know, maybe by letting people know that Shaftesbury would like to have a country store back, that there are properties available, that there are issues that have been looked at by the Planning Commission, uh, maybe it'll spark an idea in somebody's mind. And maybe it's an idea along the lines that Chris is talking about. Maybe for Shaftesbury, um, the classic village center retail is not where uh, we're going to define our identity, but maybe it comes out of something else, something more, more rural, really, which is what we are. Cinda. So, so I don't know exactly what a micro septic district is. And what I'm wondering is if that were something that the town dealt with, would that change the attractiveness of any of those three buildings? Um, certainly issues around the country store have focused around the septic thing for a really long time. And there's no real solution, I don't think, for a private um, property owner to solve that problem. Um, the, the, the state regulations for septic have only gotten worse, mm -hmm. um, or better as the case may be, but more problematic. And, you know, these are really small lots. It was one of the reasons, how many years ago, you know, we did the, the sewer study to see what the feasibility was. You know, it wasn't something at the time anybody wanted to actually think about, but I don't know what a micro district is. I don't well, know what it's, that it's means. looking at the sewer study. It, it's, that's a different term for what was suggested by the sewer study back then, which is a community septic. Uh, I believe that's what we're talking about there. Yeah, some sort of community septic at the time they were talking about maybe putting it in the schoolyard or in the, the land here at Cole okay. Hall. Okay. Uh, a large scale septic that would serve uh, a number of uh, entities in the village and solve the problem of many lots that could be developed that can't be because of septic. I, I uh, worked on one of those Tim, up in uh, Manchester. And they had a development they had built, and they had like, I believe there were six houses that all went to one septic system. Well, they, when we did the septic study, but they did not do test borings and everything else. They just took a, a topographical map and said, this looks like a good place that you could handle it. You know. So nobody ever did any test borings or, or 
geological studies or anything. They just kind of looked at different areas, and that was one of them. One of them was right right out back here where they thought that, and the other one, of course, is a school, but I don't think we're allowed to tap in. The school has since upgraded, and I don't think we're allowed to put anything more into it and that sort of stuff, but that was all talk at that time. So, Chris. I, I could point to a, a situation in our area where that exact thing is in, in place, which is uh, Shire's housing development in the center of Arlington Village, which is all fed off a common septic system. <coughs> and maybe Stephanie could tell us how many units are in Arlington Village Center. Well, it, it might still be a reasonable time to revisit some of that stuff and look at what it might take if you were looking at a commercial area and just servicing that. Um, yeah, um, I mean, we talked about this, you know, the, the septic survey and uh, the, the study that was done 10 years ago came up again during the planning commission meetings that we've had. And um, it really, I think, comes down to, to politics, really. You know, uh, <laughs> do we think this town would support spending any number of millions, one million even, uh, just we, we thought maybe just one million dollars could get us a septic that would just serve 7A to create a commercial district. And um, it, it's hard to imagine this town supporting it. I mean, just look what we went through for nine years to get a million dollars to build a garage, something we know we all need. A uh, million dollars for a, a sewer system that might bring us economic development um, well, and is a hard sell. Well, another question around that, and this had to do with funding availability, was whether any of the whether any any more things would be categorized as failures at this stage of the game um, than were I don't know 15 years ago is that when that was I don't remember how long at ago least, it was at least 15 um, because of the new standards if if that changes anything anywhere along the line do you know anything about that stuff Chris? No, not really. I mean, not as it relates to the village. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, that's, um, that's, you know, where we kind of stand with the country stores stuff. Can I just, I, can just to make a comment? Mm -hmm. Cinder did a survey many years ago. Um, of the Economic <laughs> Development Committee did. <laughs> Art, Art and you, the Economic Development Committee. Yeah. And, um, we did an extensive, quite a, quite an extensive survey on what people right, would like I, in their community. Is there anything in support? Can we do something like that again, or can we use the old one to look at and remind ourselves of what it, people had to say? Could we do another one at town meeting, hand something out for people to fill out when we go there and see what people would like? I mean, I think what Chris said about hey, we have two stores. I mean, the, the Mennonite store is superb. Yeah. And it's always packed. And now you can even eat out, outdoors. They have tables all around. Well, Wintertime, I don't know what. But um, so. Well, we certainly could consider doing another survey. But as far as what was uncovered 10 years ago, was the, the answer was clearly no. This town would not support that kind of money for a, uh, a septic Well, system. and in the meantime, there's other stuff where working on between the garage and I think there's been a water bond in the meantime. Right, so it, it, right. it's not like um, there aren't other things that were. Right. There's a beautiful apartment in the Shaftesbury Country Store. I haven't been in it in years, but I remember from years ago, it's really on the top floor and it's magnificent. You know, it you know, wood floors and it's in great shape. Yeah. Um, maybe it could be apartments for people. Housing is very hard to come by. Well, I definitely want to thank the members of the Planning Commission, Chris Williams, Mike Janowski, Mike Foley, uh, and re remind people that those are three, the, the total of three members we have on the Planning Commission now. And for over a year now, we've been looking for two more members to fill out that commission and invite people to, to, to volunteer to serve the community. But thank you, guys. Good job. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, I wanted to do a quick update on the, the southern zone process. Uh, that is going on. Let's remember that uh, two years ago, 2015, the, the legislature authorized the creation of the southern economic zone in Vermont. Uh, they produced a report that set, uh, described the economics of our region. And um, as the report said, uh, southern Vermont is in trouble. Uh, you'll be glad to know that that report did not just get thrown on a, on a, in a file cabinet and left behind. Uh, the recommendations of that report have been taken to heart by the communities and by uh, uh, Bennington County Regional Commission, Bennington County Industrial Corporation have all been working really hard to make the recommendations of their report happen. The, the main one being the creation, creation of a uh, Southern Economic Zone economic development strategy like the one in Brattleboro and to make that include the entire Southern Zone. And a couple of steps have uh, taken place uh, along those lines. Uh, this is, uh, I'm skipping through these slides. They're mainly here just to help me remember the key points. Uh, but there is a timeline for creating a southern economic zone that will include Brattleboro and uh, the, the Wyndham County and Bennington County. And both the Wyndham County people and the Bennington County people have agreed that that's, that's the goal and that we will do that. And we're, we're working along those lines. The, the main thing that's happening now, there's a regional economic development group, a red group that meets every month to talk about how we're going to do it specifically in Bennington. And a lot of what we've been focusing on is looking at how they did it in Wyndham County and what can we learn since they're three years ahead of us in terms of how we set up the structure, what goals we establish and that sort of thing. So. Uh, the, the timeline that we're looking at is uh, this been described by uh, BCRC as the pre-flight, which is the last several months of meetings where we're really brainstorming about how we're going to go about it. We're just now crossing into the, the launch phase where we're nailing down our ideas. We're getting funding to make it happen. Uh, the red group and the SEVEDS group, the southeastern Vermont Economic Development Strategy Group have been meeting together and uh, cross-pollinating with ideas. And so in the next few months, we'll be nailing that down and putting out uh, an RFP for a contractor to wrangle the paperwork to make this uh, Southern Economic Zone happen. It's a, it's a, a federal program. It's, it's quite an undertaking and it requires a professional help to make it happen in much the same way that, you know, if we build a sidewalk, we have to hire engineers to do the paperwork for, uh, for the state. So the, we're moving through this timeline here, and the goal is to uh, have something happen by early 2019. Uh, just to remember that the, the, let's see, did I go forward or backwards there? I meant to go forward, yeah. Uh, we're talking, building support for the effort. The, the, the groups on both uh, sides of the mountain have been talking to each other. We've been uh, working on getting federal funding for the effort and we have actually gotten a $70,000 grant to, to move the, the effort forward. And then uh, over the next few months, like I say, we'll be nailing that down and putting out a contract on and to seriously make the Southern ec Economic Zone happen. And this is a detailed timeline and my only goal, uh, point in including it was to rem remind myself that by February of 2019, it is our hope that we will get approval from the EDA to create the, the Southern Zone with both counties. Uh, one of the things that we've been doing a lot in our meetings is looking at the demographics of Bennington County with the idea of nailing down the goals. One of the things that has to be in our presentation to the feds when we create the Southern Zone as a group is, you know, what are our goals? It's not just to, 
say we have the southern zone and sit back and hope something happens, but to say, what are we trying to do? You know, are we trying to grow the, the economy by this much from this number to that number? What are the, the numbers that we should be looking at? And what are the numbers that describe our economic situation now? Uh, this is a good one which shows the, the decline and the projected decline in population both in Bennington County, which is the worst looking one here, in Wyndham County, and Vermont as a whole. And so clearly if we don't do anything, uh, there's just not going to be enough people to create the economic activity that we need in this area. Um, again, we talk a lot about the aging population. Uh, I agree with Tony, when you look closely at the numbers, the whole country is aging. Uh, I think if you look close enough, you can see that we're aging a little bit faster maybe than the country as a whole, but I'm starting to think that that's not something that we should focus on. And also, um, in terms of a goal, it's, it's a hard one to, to see how you, you know, make your population younger, basically. You, do, <laughs> you try to attract people. If you're able to do that, congratulations, you know. Uh, if you can get them to be young people, that's great too, but uh, none of us have really come up with an idea on how to do that. Um, this other graph here with no numbers, uh, with no numbers on, or no labels on the axes is uh, employment in <coughs> southern Vermont. And you can see that it peaked in 2006 and that we are back down to the levels of employment that you know, we were looking at 20 years ago during the Clinton years. Which, the thing is that with the aging population, is a priority shift. So instead of <laughs> country stores, we'll be geriatric care. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and you don't gener you don't you don't get rich giving each other uh, heart transplants. No, no, no. no. So, that, I mean, that, you see that all the so time. So yeah, that's why the emphasis on on a younger population. Um, one of the numbers that we focused on and we talked for uh, an entire meeting on was, uh, and it was, is this earned income ratio. Uh, how much of your total economic activity, your income in your area is earned income versus unearned income. And by earned income, they're talking about the real stuff that you want, where somebody opens a store and uh, uh, does something entrepreneurial and they earn their income from what they do or they have a job that they earn their income from the job they go to as opposed to uh, property income where you're making money off of uh, uh, the property that you own that's not necessarily generating new economic activity or also transfer income which would be people like me who come to town with a pension and buy groceries uh, you know, it, it helps, but it's not the same as if I'd come to town and uh, started business or came to town and were, you know, because there was a job here for me. So and it's would that include Social Security, pensions, yes. welfare, government yes. programs, those, all kinds? Those would all be in the transfer payments uh, category, yes. Um, one of the things that I've argued with the group is that earned income uh, is a good to have a high ratio of earned income like you know the United States is 64 percent versus uh, Bennington County is 51 uh, percent. It's a good thing to have that ratio be high uh, and it was set as a goal in the Wyndham County sets. Uh, one of their goals was to, to move that number up but I, I believe the point can be made from from my personal situation that the, the primary goal should be income. Uh, even people like me who come to town with you know, money that they bring from elsewhere, that does contribute to the, the economy in the area. It's, it's not like starting a business or finding a job here, but it is, it is something. And then this one was one that got shown to us recently. And I just bring it up here because it, it surprised me. It's a breakdown of seasonal housing, you know, how many second homes, how many seasonal homes in the various towns. And in Shaftesbury, the seasonal percentage, according to the numbers they have, is 5%. Whoops. Which 
I would have guessed that number was higher. That we have had more than than five percent second or seasonal homes. But I just thought it was interesting that that's that's what uh, BCRC gleans out of the data. Um, and this one is, is about housing. One of the recommendations in the Southern Zone report was, uh, or one of the things stated in the Southern Zone report was, was that workforce housing is a big issue and something that's holding back our economy, that people, you know, if they can get jobs here, they have a hard time finding housing that they can afford, which makes them less likely to come here and take that job because the, the housing, housing is not there. Um, these numbers say that in uh, in Bennington County uh, is talking about paying uh, more than 30 percent of your income in rental cost or in home ownership cost. Uh, the rental, the number of people who are paying more than 30 percent of their income in rental uh, housing is 52 percent, uh, and home ownership cost is 34 uh, percent. Those are generally thought to be high numbers, especially the rental, the rental numbers, which talks to the point that uh, of things like Shire's housing coming in and being ready to, to build in Shaftesbury when nobody else is ready to build in Shaftesbury, building exactly what we need to, to advance the economy here and why we're, we're going to do what we can to, to see if we can solve that water problem. Chris, did you have a point there? Yeah, briefly, uh, in discussions with Brian Lent at William E. Daly and uh, Trevor Mann Satam, that they both cite the need for re uh, workforce housing to be able to grow their businesses, that they're jammed up by the non availability of workforce housing in the Shaftesbury area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. And then this is uh, a, a graph, it just is um, very demonstrative, demonstrative, that's why I put it in here. It shows very dramatically the, the, the economic decline. It points to housing, but this is specifically about Manchester, Dorset, uh, not getting into the details of the, the chart over here, but, uh, the table over here, but just the chart of building permits issued in Manchester over the last several years. And the ones that are for multifamily housing are essentially zero. And it just says that, you know, those kinds of things that the area really needs are just, just not happening. Um, and again, going back to, you know, what we were talking about at the country store and, you know, the, the, the efforts from the community, uh, I kind of, uh, I'm, I'm reminded of the Putnam complex in Bennington, which in a way is a big scale version of the country store examples that you've been talking about in, the, in these little towns where the community, in this case Bennington, which is bigger than some of these places that, that brought in country stores, have said nothing's going to happen in Bennington unless we the community get together and make something happen. And they're really doing that in a big way. Um, and one of the things that was pointed out in one of our meetings recently that's really exciting is that Putnam development right now has a wait list for people who want to move into it when it gets built. So, and that happened in large part because local investors got together with local officials and said, let's, let's try to make something happen. So any questions there? Um, just to, to mention a couple of things that are happening, and I don't have the dates in front of me, but if you're interested in going, there's a lot of interesting meetings coming up. One coming up next Tuesday, I believe it's in Arlington, uh, which is the kind of the road show for Phil Scott's Voric Initiative, which is about uh, recreational opportunities, creating economic activity across Vermont. And there's uh, one coming to, to our area next Tuesday, and I know a lot of people that I've been talking with both in these red group meetings and in other work I've been doing to publicize hiking trails in this area are planning on being at that one. And then uh, specifically related to the Southern Zone, there's a, a, like a two county meeting on connectivity issues in this area, uh, internet 
connectivity. One of the one of the big things uh, that's holding back that I think we all believe is holding back our economy is the lack of of internet, particularly in rural areas. A lot of us have thought, I've certainly thought since the day I came to town and couldn't get internet that there was bound to be a lot of people who would love to come here and do internet related jobs that they can do anywhere on a computer if they had that connectivity. So there's a, a, a summit on that coming up November 1st also. Questions, comments? Okay. Uh, Thanks for this work, Tim. Sure, sure. You're welcome. Okay, the other big uh, important issue coming up very soon in our area is this uh, Act 46 school board consolidation vote on November 7th. Probably a lot of people don't realize even yet that we have a, an election on November 7th. And what we're voting on is essentially turning our supervisory union. Okay, is uh, turning our supervisory union into a school district. And this, quite frankly, has been essentially forced on us by Act 46 consolidation, school board consolidation bill. And it's, it's really important. It's one of those things that a lot of us, uh, myself included, I was not uh, a big Act 46 fan for a long time, but I have come to realize that this is going to happen. And the, what the Act 46 bill is about is the state mandating that there are just too many school boards in the state. We, there's a school board for every school. We're the only state that does it that way. And it's been decided that there will be fewer. And the state, I think wisely, has not said there are going to be these 12 districts. They're, they have said, you guys, we want there to be fewer school districts. It's inefficient. It's not a good model. The local communities need to figure out how they want to do this themselves. And that's been happening for the last couple of years now. And it's come down to a vote to turn the SU into a district. Uh, here in Shaftesbury, there have been other things looked at. The, the school board and our local Act 46 committee have looked at merging with Arlington, including North Bennington in that. The, uh, the problem with those plans has really come the biggest roadblock to any of those plans. One is, again, lack of a big upswelling of community support to, to really make those things happen. But the, the, what would have to happen for that to, to occur is getting out of the Mount Anthony Union high school district that we're in. And the, the road, the, the way that you, th that was set up, it was set up to be intentionally difficult to get it out of. And it is very difficult. And if we were going to go somewhere else and do something like that, it would require all the five towns that are in the Mount Anthony Union uh, Bennington, Shaftesbury, Pownall, North Bennington, and Woodford. Each of those towns would in individually have to vote to let Shaftesbury out. And all of us thought that that was a really huge hurdle and quite frankly we had a hard time imagining how we would convince people to let us do that because taking students out of their district is not going to help them with their, their cost situation. So it was, it was uh, just not something that we ever felt was was really feasible. And so what ended up being the most logical thing to do was to turn the SU into a district. The main things that happen if we turn the SU into a school district is every school does not have a school board anymore. You have one district board like they do in all other parts of the country. And the school board, school district property becomes the property of the district. And again, that's not that scary, that's how everybody else else does that sort of thing. Uh, when sitting down to decide how to do this, the study committee that has written the articles of agreement that you will be voting on on November 7th to decide if we're going to do this, have uh, wisely, I believe, adopted the Mount Anthony Union model of representation. And that's one of the key 
features to keep in mind when we decide whether or not to go this route. Keep in mind that this vote on November 7th is not a vote for or against Act 46. Act 46 is happening to us. This is a, a vote about whether or not we decide how we consolidate or the state decides for us, because that's what Act 46, Act 46 says. If you don't do it yourself, we'll tell you what your district is going to look like. And one of the things that has worked well in this area is the An Mount Anthony Union model of representation. Because one of the problems we have is we have Bennington, which is a big town with a large population and a large school population and a lot of little towns in, in that Mount Anthony Union. What was uh, figured out back in 1974 when this model was created and it required special act of the legislature to create it was to allow a somewhat proportional model. And what it does is it gives Bennington more votes than anybody else and it gives the bigger towns more votes than the smaller towns. But it doesn't, it's not strictly proportional because a strictly proportional model that was just based on population would give Bennington majority control of that board at all times. And Bennington could do you know, whatever they wanted. Uh, they could decide that they want to close a school and the, the other towns really couldn't stop them if they wanted to. With the Mount Anthony Union model and this representation based on this somewhat proportional model, no town, including Bennington, can act without some sort of coalition from other towns. Similarly, if all the little towns got together and decided they wanted to do something, they would have enough votes to, to make that happen. And this has proven an effective model for 40 plus years now. And uh, David Durfee made the comment at the meeting we had the other night that because of this model, there is this sense of cooperation, a spirit of, of coalition on the board where uh, the board members of the Mount Anthony Union do look at this as a community rather than just, you know, how do I get my part part of this? Because it is is a model that forces people to 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 coalesce and cooperate and compromise. So uh, I want to urge everyone to 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 consider these issues and I think it's real important that we do this on our own rather than letting the state decide how we're going to do this. And I'm also looking for support from this board. Uh, after the meeting we had the other night, I talked with Ed Malloy of the school board and the principal and, we, uh, and several members of the current school board, and we all feel like it's important that our citizens turn out and vote for this, this, uh, these articles of agreement and create the new district under our terms. And I'm looking for the support of our, our board here that, so that we can go to the public with the idea that this is something we support. I'm opposed to the select board taking a stand on this. I don't think we should be doing this. I can't this. hear you, Art. I'm sorry. I'm opposed to the select board taking a stand on this. I think we should let the citizens decide how they're going to vote and not. We can do information and we can do what you've been talking about, but as far as the select board taking a position, I'm against it. Other comments? Um, well, I'll just say I, I disagree with that. I think part of our charge as elected officials is to, to lead our citizens in public. Um, but no, we are not going to tell them how to vote. Um, sure we can. We told them how to vote on the garage. No. No, we did not tell them how to vote. Well. You're we, part of the school board. What's your feeling, Tony? I, I agree. I agree with that. I think that the responsibility is the school board to provide the information that they need to to vote. The people need to vote. Um, you know, I I would love to see us meet on a regular basis with the school board to talk about common goals. Um, but I'd like to see the school board take a leadership position in uh, advertising and providing information both through the media and through individual contact within the town. Um, and, and 
and, and do something. I'm still, I have no idea what's going on. There was very little information presented to the public at all. I have no idea, you know, I mean, I, I am in total favor of consolidation, but the consequences of that consolidation have yet to be really defined. Um, and I think the school boards have been lax in providing that information uh, and slow in bringing it out to the public. Um, so I, I agree with that. I, I think that this is something the school board needs to take responsibility for um, and, uh, and not the board itself. I mean, I'd be happy, uh, you know, I mean, I, my public stand is, yeah, let's go for consolidation. Um, but I don't but think I'm it's... I'm not against the consolidation. I just yeah. think that this is not something that the select board should be doing. Yeah, I, I agree. Well, you certainly agree that, that each of us is a, a citizen who has the right to their opinion. Absolutely. 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 And if I wanted to send, if I wanted to, to put a letter in the banner, I would on uh, supporting that, uh, you know, uh, if I thought that was necessary. Uh, Can I so. jump in? May I jump in? Yeah. I worked on this bill for four years. Um, next to getting over between three and four hundred thousand dollars to close the landfill, I think this is the greatest gift I could give to my town. And there is a lot of information. There is a pile of information. It is beautifully put together. And who put it together? The study committee. What is the study committee? The study committee is part of the legislation. The state did not want to come in and say, this is how you're going to do it. Instead, it created study committees in every single town in the state of Vermont to figure out how to make them, this work for themselves. The study committee made a big presentation a day or two ago at the school, handed out all this material. What they didn't do, which is a mistake, and I hope it's being fixed, is put it on the website so everybody could access it. Let me tell you what's happening here, why this is so serious for us as a town, as a region, and to the state of Vermont, to the school system. We have lost 26,000 kids, 20% of our students, since 1997. That's a lot of kids. But we haven't lost any staff or faculty. So what's happening? Our property taxes are going out of sight. The purpose of this bill is to reduce property taxes so people can afford to live here. Also, this bill reduces our property taxes. If we do this now and pass this in the towns that were mentioned, Pownall, Shaftesbury, Woodford, Bennington, we will have our property taxes reduced in the first year by eight cents, in the second year by six, in the third year by four, in the next year by two. Be a tremendous benefit. We will be able to, oh, here's another thing I just learned. I just learned that the teacher-student ratio in Vermont has dropped again. We were at 10 or 11. It is even lower than that student-to-teacher. Hundreds of people approached the former Speaker of the House and asked him to do something, Shap Smith was his name, about property taxes. This was handed over to my committee to do something about. I just looked at the enrollment in just our area to find out. I mean, I remember years ago, the enrollment at the high school was about 1,600. Am I right? You know what it is today? Under eight, it's just a little over 800. Terrible. I just looked at the enrollment of all the elementary schools in our area, Panel, Shaftesbury, etc. It's all gone down. We can't afford, we have to do something about that. So what this, what this bill is trying to do for us 
is to create a district where we can maybe share teachers, music teachers, art teachers, nurses, and we don't need it full time, a person full time, but we can share them among our schools. Ask me a question. <laughs> You're preaching to the choir. Huh? I've been here for 40 years watching. I know, and you've one, been in the system. One survey after another about the governance of Vermont schools. I came the year after the consolidation of Mount Anthony. I know that the struggles still persist in the community for generations. Uh, I taught in the school where it was divided because of the closing of Catholic, Catholic High and, and Mount Anthony being made and to trying to get the kids to consolidate into an intercohesive group. It took generations to do that. I am totally for consolidation, absolutely. But I don't think it's the governance of this board is responsible. Oh, sure, for going sure. Out and I mean, that's that's, that's, that's 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 another kind of decision. I mean, that's a whole other. Thing. That's another kind yeah. of decision. I mean, All yeah. I'm telling yeah. you tonight is the seriousness of Alice, this. I hope this so. is a question of survival. I hope so. I we don't really understand, Alice. We yeah. understand. I hope so. You I know, just I want think, to inform you and educate you about what is going on here. And I think in some districts. That the consolidation worked beautifully because there were some school districts that are willing to give up schools and consolidate That's right, schools. Tony. I think we're going to have a struggle in this district. I Have think we're going to have a real struggle closing schools down, which needs to happen because of the population. But I know I came from a school district up north where this school is still open, and I watch the population of students go from 200 down to almost 100 and that school is still open and people are willing to pay the taxes i'm in district one i'm not even in Shaftesbury district me too yes we're in district one what i you know, and so there's there's a whole other story so yeah, absolutely alice i mean i the word know, consolidation should be changed I don't, it, it has a funny feel to me well, we're consolidating. It's, uni We've un it's unification. Yeah. Nothing is going right. to change in our individual right. schools. Right. Now, I know you're not the school board, and I can see Art thinking, why is she talking to us about this party? I hope Well, not. I think this is a good vehicle. You just need to be informed <laughs> about the seriousness for Absolutely. our children, for Absolutely. our families. Absolutely. And get out there and drum And let me tell you something else that's so important door. about this. This is really critical. If we don't pass this, we're going to lose control over our schools. Why? Because if we pass this in all of our towns, we will have five of the nine board seats. We, by, I mean small rural Vermont, Shaftesbury, Pownall, Woodford, be two for Shaftesbury, two for Pownall, one for Wood, five. Four from Bennington. If we don't pass this, it'll become what's called proportional. Right. Bennington will have 68% of the vote, and they can do what they want to all of us. Chris, as I said at the informational meeting Thanks for this week, time. I think consolidation is totally appropriate. Um, you know, these school boards are way too small a unit in terms of what it is they control and decide upon. Totally appropriate to, to more efficient to be a larger unit. My, my misgiving is the partner that we've chosen to go to the dance with, and that is Bennington. Now, my experience working for five years to build a new middle school, pass a bond vote that took four votes, Bennington voted no four times. <coughs> Bennington elected to their board somebody who had been in prison for defrauding the school system and continues to have this person on their board. This is a partner we want to go to the dance with. I mean, come on, what are we thinking about? So I say, yeah, the, the impetus is correct. But boy, I don't want to do it with Bennington. I just don't want to. There's a million reasons not to choose this town that we've watched decline for a whole generation to the low point that they're in now. 
future is not bright for Bennington, and we're going to hook our wagon to them? I don't think so. I was going to say, one part of the uh, the thing that I understand is we assume their assets and liabilities are their assets and their debt as well. Well, the biggest Which, piece, as is I that, understand it, is the middle school bond. There's been a tax analysis done, and uh, some towns will see their taxes go up, some will see them go down. The, the analysis says tax rate in Shaftesbury will not change. And as far as the voting goes, I mean, Joe Crossman brought up a good point at that meeting with the Act 46, is if, what if they did vote a school out? Well, then that would leave Bennington with the overwhelming you know, power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, North awesome. Bennington has found way. a way to go their own route and to take control of their destiny. Shaftesbury should do something of the same. So what I'm saying, though, is if, if the state takes over, I guess we're... Yeah, well, let okay. that scare you to vote for this thing, but I'm not going no, to... No, 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 I'm not saying that. Well, see, but this is a scare tactic. You either vote yes or the state comes in and God knows what will happen. Well, what I'm saying is either, either way you crack your eggs, you're going to end up with a mess. Well, I kind of agree with that. But that's where, you know, I mean, I just, those were some concerns that I had was just, you know, assuming their debt, their overwhelming debt. That's, I think, and in, in maybe in the, like you were saying with the tax breaks, I mean, that's going to be well for the first, you know, what, four years, five years. But after that, I think it's going to come on to us. You're going to see an ex exponential hike. Maybe I'm wrong. I probably am. But that's... Here's all the papers that were handed out. If I give these to David, perhaps he would make a copy for all of you. All the questions, Joe, that you're addressing and asking, all the answers are in here. Okay. This is a great document. This is our study committee. Jeff Leake is on it from Shaftesbury. Um, Don Campbell from Bennington. And Mrs. McEnany. What's her first name? Remember? Aaron. Well, Mrs. Yeah. McEnany from Shaftesbury. They've worked all kinds of hours, all kinds of time to, to, to study this and put this together and make a proposal. Mm -hmm. And here it is. Incredible information about us. And everybody needs to read that because it's the you fear know, of the unknown, I think, at this point. To, people. Everybody needs to read this. Yeah. All right, well, let's... Uh, uh, let me just say that um, I had hoped to get select board support for this because I think it's an important issue and one that, uh, in, in my opinion, the town needs to vote for. Uh, it appears that this uh, select board does not want to take a, an opinion as a board. Uh, let me just say that um, uh, I have circulated to you a letter that is uh, uh, an open letter that will be submitted to the banner that will include four members of the school board, the school principal, our state rep, myself, and anyone who wants to join in support of a yes vote on November 7th is welcome to let me know and we'll, uh, we'll submit that letter together. Okay. Cinda, <laughs> would you like to tell well, us? With our that? aging population, now we can talk yeah. about cemeteries. <laughs> <laughs> Priorities. <laughs> it's going to be. <laughs> yeah. uh, I invited Cinda here because. Oh, come on, this is really exciting. I never. <laughs> 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 Sorry. I invited Cinda here to talk about some of the reserve funds that some of us have kind of belatedly learned that. Uh, the town has and how they all work, and some of them are specifically related to our cemeteries. So I thought you could bring us up to speed on what the funds are, how much is in them, and what we can do with them. Okay. Well, l l let me give you a little information, and then what I'll try to do is answer questions that you might have. And if I can't answer them, I'll find the information and come back to you. Um, so right now, there are three funds held by the trustee of pu trustees of public funds um, that have to do with cemeteries. They are called the Cemetery Trust Fund, 
the Cemetery Perpetual Care Fund, and the Huntington Cemetery Fund. Um, I don't have dates for establishment of all of those funds. The Huntington Fund was based on an 1890 gift. None of these are new. They're all, they've all been around for a long time. The purposes are very specific um, for each one of the funds. Uh, so the Cemetery Trust Fund, which has, um, as of the audited statement, June 2016, your current audit is out, so I'm not sure um, what the number is for right now, but as of 2016, it was $24,666. Um, this is the Cemetery Trust Fund. These funds um, are set aside by the select board to acquire equipment needed for the care of our cemeteries or for the procurement of additional land if necessary um, for cemeteries. So, that for example, we have acquired new cemeteries lately that if we needed a, a mower to, to keep up the new cemeteries that we've acquired, Correct. this fund could be used to do that. Correct. Because we contract those services out, that is not something that we probably are looking at right at the moment. Right. But as you all know, things change, so there may come a time when that will be relevant. The Cemetery Perpetual Care Fund, um, as the name implies, is for the perpetual care of cemeteries. So that is funded by um, lot fees. When we sell a lot in the cemetery, half of that money goes to the Perpetual Care Fund and half of it goes um, for the annual cemetery costs. Um, so the Cemetery Perpetual Care Fund says these funds result from payments made to the town of Shaftesbury to provide for the perpetu perpetual care of cemetery lots. An amount for this purpose is included in the price of each lot sold. Monies received by the town from this source become part of the principal of the fund and may not be used for any other purpose but to produce income for the perpetual care. This income is used by the town for cemetery care under the supervision of the select board. The annual net income from this fund is remitted to the town of Shaftesbury after the close of the fiscal year. So the cemetery perpetual care fund at the moment has 125,280, that's as of June 2016. Um, the income, from that fund is, well, 2016, it was almost $3,000. Um, the income from the Cemetery Trust Fund was $587. So that approximately $3,500 is remitted to the town and is part of what covers the annual budget for cemeteries, not the principal. And it's one of the reasons we raised the prices for lots, so that this began to, um, I mean, we'd have to raise them a whole lot to actually cover the cost of, of cemetery maintenance. Um, the Huntington but Cemetery just Fund. Just before we leave those two, though, that is happening, that every year part of the revenues in our budget is the income from those two funds. The Huntington Cemetery Fund is the most restrictive. It is, as I said, based on an 1890 gift um, in trust by Calvin Huntington, established uh, to provide income to keep in repair the family gravestones of his relations in the town graveyard, which is the Center Shaftesbury graveyard, and it's the stones that are in the front next to the church. Um, fund principal may not be expended for any purpose, income from these funds may only be used for the stated purpose of the fund. So if we have no repair or maintenance to the Huntington family stones, 
that money just rolls over on itself. We don't get any of the income from that fund. So those are the three cemetery funds. Um, and as I say, held by the trustees. Um, and all of that is separate, except for the, that small 3,500, give or take, income piece that we get um, from the budget that the cemetery committee prevent, presents to you each year. Um, we contract out the maintenance um, and we build into our budget um, some maintenance that's over and above uh, mowing. Um, so there can be you know, fences that need to be fixed, brush that needs to be cleared, trees that need to come down. There is another fund. <laughs> it is not held by the trustees. It is a reserve fund that was set up by the town. It was set up in 2010. Oh, wait, before I go there, let me talk about Grandview Cemetery. Um, as you all know, Shaftesbury took over Grandview Cemetery. That brought to the town um, hold it, hold it eighty-one thousand, approximately eighty-two thousand um, dollars. That money is still sitting in the general fund. I'm not sure what we're waiting for. It is to be transferred to the perpetual care fund. It is their perpetual care monies. Um, so it needs to go to our perpetual care fund. Um, I'm not sure what the holdup is on that, but so if, if it's something you guys need to um, order to have happen, could you please do that? Um, when you say it's in the general fund, you're talking about your general the, the fund. Town's general fund. The town's general Money fund. And it North needs Bank to be turned over to the trustees. The and when the cemetery board voted a month ago how they wanted to split up, uh, I talked to Rob. Everything has to go to Rob. And then it's just a matter of Rob oh. and I getting together and transferring, <laughs> him getting a check from us, and then he'll administer it from there. It's, it's just a transfer, but there was some confusion about uh, the way it was. We got the money directly to us, and it only needs to be transferred to him, but we were kind of waiting to see what the split was, and then we decided even if we want to split it between going to perpetual care, and I think what is it, 10 or 15,000 that's going to go to bring uh, Grandview up to date. It still all has to come from the trustees. So as soon as you're ready, call Melanie, and we'll just send you a check, basically. Yeah. I don't know what the procedures are on your end, but as soon as we're ready, we'll just send you a check. Because it is just sitting in our... Then, then let me just request. OK. Ever send then I'll tell Melanie to write you a check. Because <laughs> it's collecting our huge interest rate in our checking account. <laughs> <laughs> So apropos of I that, that though, before we leave, that is that is that how that happens? That that money passes from Grandview Cemetery Association to the pub, trustees of public funds without going through the select board? You you have the money. It's in the general we, fund. We had the money. We agreed on we, we agreed on which that was the transfer. Did we? When, did we yeah. Maybe I'm just not remembering. Did we vote to put it into yeah. the? The money is the coming from yes, their, okay, the, the point is really the money is coming from their perpetual fund and their, their little reserve fund. So it really needs to go into the board of trustees to maintain the perpetual care. Otherwise, we're going to be in a big deficit because it's, a, you know, the money that those people pay for perpetual care really has to go into ours because we own it now. And we're taking out the portion we need to bring the cemetery up. To well, as part of the transfer, there were some issues like a survey, so we know exactly where the boundaries are. I think I talked about that last time I came in. Um, and there are, some, um, there are some trees that need to come down. Mm -hmm. um, some kind of basic level maintenance on the east side of the cemetery. There are some graves that are almost overgrown and so we need to clean that up as part of getting the cemetery and making sure that um, it is in good condition as we go forward. 
a big chunk. That, that money came to the town in three lots. Mm -hmm. I think they had some money in a checking account, they had some money in a money market account, money and they had some money in their perpetual care fund or whatever, however that was set up. Um, so all of those monies have come in. Um, and what we have, what the cemetery committee did was um, opt to either keep out or come back $15,000 so that we could get all of those things done. When they're done, anything that's left over would still go back to the perpetual care fund. Um, and I think the yeah. question is whether we can hold it out on the front end or whether it needs to go to you and then come back. So whatever anybody decides is fine. The recommendation was to take the entire amount, pass it to the trustees, and then provide fine. You with Perfect. whatever you need. For so we, we had checked with, with our accountants about it. And, and the way it breaks down, too, is the bulk of the money, the 62000 I think it was, was the actual perpetual care fund. Yes. And the other was a CD and the, the minimal right. checking account. So their perpetual care fund is actually going to get a little bit more money than it, it had when, when we transferred it out. Would it be beneficial to keep that as a separate perpetual care fund? Say that again? Would, you, would, it, would it be beneficial to keep that as a separate fund? Or well, we talked about that, and I don't think that's necessary. Okay. Um, if, if that's easier from your point of view. We, we had a conversation about it, and I don't think there's any reason to keep it separate. Um, the, the, only possible, the only possible um, reason to do that, uh, and, and it actually that doesn't, um, we need to budget for Grandview um, we need to have a budget just for Grandview because we want to be able to go to North Bennington um, and ask them to pay half of what our costs are for maintaining the Grandview Cemetery. Art and I went to see them, I don't know, a year ago, a year and a half ago. Yeah. Um, so they're expecting that, and so as part of this fall's budgeting, we need to be able to go back to them and say we need X number of dollars and because their budget was already established correct when we went they're waiting for yes. a number from us to put in their next mm -hmm. budget cycle yeah this is the trustees of Bennington correct of North Bennington of North Bennington, North Bennington. Bennington. yes, yes. Um, so anyway I mean I, I this took a lot longer for all of this to actually happen than any of us okay. ever anticipated <laughs> but it's done now so this would be the time to go. So as we do our budget um, this fall, um, we'll, that, that's part of what we'll be doing, is looking for um, half of that from North Bennington. Okay. So um, if you, is there anything I should have said about the perpetual care funds that I didn't? No, I think, I think you've got as much information, probably even more about how it's used than, than I do. Um, we're just taking care of mine, and, and it's up to you to decide where it goes. Thank you, you're doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the, other fund, the other fund is a reserve fund that was set up in 2010. Um, we have so far, we can do a little more homework on this, but so far, we have not found a clear stated purpose for the establishment of that fund. The cemetery committee asked for it to be set up because we were looking to continue the fence that's on um, um, the South Shaftesbury Cemetery. There's a nice wrought iron fence across the front nothing on Cleveland Avenue. And what we were hoping to do was run that same fence um, along Cleveland Avenue. At the time we priced it, we, we uh, to actually have wrought iron again or whatever it's made out of, um, was on the order of $60,000. So we had 
asked to set up a reserve fund so that we could put a little bits of money in over time and then at some point be able to um, put fence there. What has happened um, in the absence of clear language anywhere um, is that the fund was set up and money has been put in it. There's, um, Melanie said there's like $30,000 in it. I'm not even sure how we got that much money in it, but anyway. Um, that's supposedly there's $30,000 in it um, and it is being used for um, bigger cemetery projects. So for example, Maple Hill, when we put the, the road in up there, actually the two roads have gone in up there. Um, and when we've had some bigger tree work that has needed to be done, money has come out of that fund. Um, I think we need to do a little more homework um, I'll come back to you with exactly how, or I'll send it to you, you know, exactly how much money has been put in that fund over time. Um, again, we're, we're lacking sort of clear language around what it's for. We thought it was for one thing. Um, it's not how it's being used. Um, the, the fence thing, one of the things we are currently talking about is the possibility of doing a green fence um, along Cleveland Avenue. Um, it would probably cost a lot less than $60,000. Um, and you, if, if you needed, um, if you needed a, a more substantial fence, you could put it on the inside of a planting. Um, I don't know that you would, but if you did, you could do that, and then that wouldn't show, and it wouldn't matter so much that it didn't match what was on the front. Um, so we're we're looking at that. No final decision has been made, but we're looking at that. If we did that, and we all just decided, you know, l leaving this reserve fund for the kinds of things it's currently being used for, um, you know, that's okay. If we all think having a wrought iron fence that goes the rest of the way around the cemetery is important, then we should probably have language that clarifies that somewhere along the line. Is that $60,000 that installed? Uh, yeah, I'm, I, again, this was a number we got a few years ago, okay, okay, so yeah, yeah. it probably hasn't gotten better in the meantime. Yeah, right. well, <laughs> that, that was a chain reed fence, I believe, before they put the sidewalk in. Yeah, well, yeah, and that we would not want to put a chain link fence across there. Right. Just for the aesthetic value, you want to keep the chain link out? We're looking for more aesthetically right. pleasing. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, but that, the one that's up the front is in pretty rough shape. I was going to say, that needs to be. Yeah. 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 It, it does, and it probably needs to be painted. It's the same kind of fencing that's in um, um, the center. Sorry. I, I, cemetery sure across the front the there around the side. Right, because it's, it's, a lot of it looks like it needs to be replaced. Yeah. Well, I'm sure it's been there for... Well, I understand. It was there when I was a kid. Since Adam won the bridges. That was a couple days ago. Is it that old? God. And that was a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it might be placed. Thank you. Um, I don't know. I don't... Rod Iron doesn't peel, does it? That's all painted. Well, but it's iron underneath. It may have been painted more than once over time. I don't. Well, I don't have any idea. Yeah. Well, I don't, um, I don't know. I but anyway, the, the, that way, the issue is really that that fund doesn't have a clear. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, one thing about the fund, I think the first entry we found for it was a thousand dollars in two thousand nine. So the thirty thousand is really the accumulation of what's been voted into that for the last several years. Some years it's been five. Some years it's been four. When we actually did the the work up there. We increased it to 9000 that year, money in the reserve fund, so Ken would have the money to build those roads. So this is like the, it's, this is actually, we probably took some money out, I, I'll print that out tomorrow because I'm kind of curious. We probably did take some out when a huge tree fell or something to cover because we were out of the maintenance budget, but the 30000 is just that accumulation from 2009. But you're still right, what's the end goal? If it really is a fence, then we have to do what I did last year is up it for one year so that we can build a road and 
but keep towards the goal of the fence because you're right, it's not getting any cheaper. So maybe we <laughs> Well, and I, I think the committee needs to have some more conversation. Yeah. You know, at the time we <clears throat> thought that was a way to get to that kind of fence. It, you know, whether that's the most important thing, um, that given all the rest of the things that the community is dealing with, you know, may or may not be the case. So we'll talk about it and, and it'll come back with a recommendation um, to the select board. But I just wanted you to know that there was that other fund. It is not held by the trustees. It's wherever and however you deal with reserve funds. Yeah. Um, if, if the funds are set aside for some of the purposes, whatever that may be, I think we are supposed to be handling that. Managing that money, um, so I don't know. I don't know where it is right now. I, this this is news to me. Oh, this reserve fund is, is just a standard. The town can set any any reserve fund for anything with voter approval. So this reserve fund was not set up as a trust right. fund in, in the way you guys right. handle it. This is approved every year. A donation in uh, not a donation. Uh, a, a allocation uh, yeah, the uh, into this fund that's to be used for uh, operational things, uh, unusual things like building the driveway, or we started this fund was possibly, this wording is vague, uh, but the intent apparently was just to save up separately for from, from tax dollars to build the fence around there. And that's the part we have to clarify, but your trustee funds are, are a different matter altogether. The, contributions to perpetual funds that's lined out in the paperwork people do to buy plots and the other was like Huntington and that is just a you know bequest but this is completely so this is like our class B road fund that's in the same category uh, that this is truck fund not, or, or a truck fund or the fire truck fund or yeah but it, within the state statutes uh, it, it's pretty clear that the trustees are to manage any funds that are used for cemetery purposes. So, I'm, I'm, well, I'm not, you're, you're I know, I know, I know where, what, what you're citing, and I think we're, we're into, uh, you know, that <laughs> is authority over, over these, these funds, your funds, and this is really the operating budget, unless the statutes can be interpreted that, interpreted that you're going to supervise all the spending in the cemetery, everything Ken does, every aspect of its daily operations. It's a good question. Maybe we ought to make, make sure, and then we would just eliminate this fund altogether and just make it a transfer to um, something over in your end. Because this is more operational. Yeah, I was going to say the difference is the, the reserve funds are um, m monies that you can use all of it. Your funds, we can only use income. Well, not necessarily. Well, actually, that's not true yeah, for the cemetery yeah. trust fund. If we need a lawnmower, yeah. then that's. Yeah. Um, and, and that's really, I think, up to yeah. the board to determine how much of any of the funds gets used to a certain Well, what we have discovered when we were looking today, because the only language we could find back in 2009 was pretty vague, and we kind of had the impression that this was set up to collect money for a fence. And that's why I just upped it to one year because to put that money for the road in one place. But now we're kind of curious too because, like, when we start the Class Three Reserve Fund, that has to be on the ballot, it has to be approved to start that. And uh, we didn't get a chance today to go back to 2008 and 2009 to see if this appeared anywhere. So, so it, and again, I don't know. This was from. Um, this was from 2010 town report and these were budget notes that were in and so it says I have no idea who wrote this um, the cemetery reserve fund monies the voters approve to be held in the cemetery trust and managed by the trustees of public funds the cemetery trust is used to purchase equipment and land for cemetery purposes this sounds to me as though somebody is confusing the cemetery trust fund, which is for equipment and land, with the reserve fund that was never actually established. I mean, uh, usually when you vote for a reserve fund, it says what it's supposed to be for. 
We can't find that anywhere. We've looked in the voting records for that? I, I have no Yes, we, we were looking at, yeah, 2009, 2010. We can go back and look some more and see if we can find but that would be the we, whole thing. We don't know a reserve if it's fund like <laughs> if it's a reserve fund like the class three road fund, there's gotta be a vote in the to town clerk's work. records that says this is establishing a fund for this. The project. first That's allocation the was in the, the budget voted for the two thousand ten year. So it was the two thousand nine report. That's the first time it shows up and it was a thousand dollars um that year, but there's nothing in the voting um, that, it, and, and the, the vote was will you allocate a thousand dollars to the cemetery reserve fund. There's nothing that actually sets up the reserve fund with a purpose. Okay. That may get into a legal question. If we have a defect in the process, there we'll have to check. Yeah, the, the I mean, I mean, that's what it would have boils down to. Whether we take the thirty thousand and just transfer it to the write another check to the trustees <laughs> and just move it over, but we do need to determine uh, if the wording wasn't correct in two thousand and nine. We have to see if if this was set up improperly, and if so. And I think what we really have to do is make sure the purpose is clear. Yeah. Whatever it's going to be, I, I think it's really important. And that can come up in minutes, which is what I wanted to get into when I have a chance to start reading some minutes around leading up to it. If there was conversation about what the actual purpose of this was, what the intent was. Yeah, uh, but let's make sure we check first the, the, the voting records, because that's what matters, is what was put to the voters. Mm -hmm. If the voters yeah. voted for yeah. purpose A, that is the purpose of that. Uh, right despite what the select board may have intended to do, what matters is what the voters voted on. So we need to make sure that uh, if we can't find the, uh, a record of that vote, then we're in lawyer territory. Well, we have the year, so with. it should be, you know, it's a year's worth of minutes at worst that we get to go through. Okay. So if you don't have any more questions. Any more questions for Cindy? Very nice, two tasteful signs. Oh, great. Two yes. very tasteful signs. Um, those were donated by the Grange. They called us up and um, I want to say it was $2,500. Um, so there are, I believe, I don't know if there are two in the cemetery. There are two in the um, center cemetery. Oh, so they did all the I th So all the cemeteries are getting the same kind of yeah. signs. Um, oh, and they, I haven't noticed those. Yet. Very nice. Oh, very good. 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 The, the other thing um, that's in there, we've put in the cemeteries is an informational, I want to say kiosk, but that's, it's basically a post with a, you know, a letter holder, eight and a half by 11 piece of paper holder that has all of the, the uh, cemetery regulations on it in the cemetery. So if you're wandering around and you need to know. Oh, the last thing is if you could um, maybe mention at a couple of meetings that it's time for people to clean out the cemeteries for any um, items that have decorated graves over the summer. So thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Okay, item 12, website design vendor. Um, I have uh, looked at three. Uh, I think the best choice is to go with Spectrum Design, which is uh, a company owned by Jonas Spivak, who is uh, chair, uh, president of the Bennington Chamber of Commerce. Um, he's somebody I know from other, other things. Uh, I've looked at his example work. He's given us a good price on that. Uh, the initial price was actually one of the lowest, and then he added a few hundred dollars to it when we clarified exactly how we were going to be reorganizing our documents. But that's uh, going to be around $2,000, which is under the limit that requires a vote. Uh, it's uh, $3,000. It's, it's, yeah, all you need is three, uh, three uh, 
proposals. Three proposals. So without objection, I will uh, move ahead with that. Mike Chianowski of the uh, Planning Commission and uh, uh, graphic designer himself has been helping me go through that. So we'll be uh, getting going forward with the process, and it's going to be a you know, starting point. Is the what I presented a few meetings back when in terms of uh, changing the design to be uh, brighter, to have more information about uh, the town in terms of attracting people, economic development, uh, publicizing the trails that I've been talking about, as well as reorganizing it and putting into something that, uh, into a content management system that can be changed more easily. I want to vote on that. Would you, would you like a motion? Um, I think we can just go ahead and yeah. This is do that. below the the the, the amount that's required. It's just uh, I'm updating the board on it. It's, uh, it's uh, yep. considered an incidental yep. range it's of okay. expenses. Okay, town garage update. Anything to? Oh, talk there really about is there? no update. Uh, yeah, the stone water along. review. Uh, I pinged on Merrill a couple of times. Uh, a lot to go through. It's kind of uncharted territory, so um, it's just moving along. Okay. Kind of a yeah. space, but what's the date that they're for the first public pickup of some of some documents? I think we're aiming for the meeting in November now, but that we're still waiting on. We have to get uh, yeah. We, that was one back. of the to do. Uh, the action items from that special meeting we had on that, and I don't believe we've had a, a well, schedule just, submitted yeah, to us yet. Yeah, until we iron out what the actual AIA contract's going to say or our altering of it, and we come to an agreement between the lawyers and the architects on that, okay. uh, we can set a date. But once that's agreed, it's everything's ready to go. It's it is. just we have okay. to get the wording yeah, okay. set, and uh, then it's just picking a date because it's as I, soon as it's agreed, we can quickly advertise and get it going. So, because yeah, I got a call today from somebody that. Yeah, know. I'm sure. And time's ticking. I would like to get it out there in November. Yeah. Okay. So people get it on their radar. But we're still looking at a bid opening of the first of the year. First of the year, yes. Yeah. Uh, but it's because of its kind of unusual nature and the way it's set up. It'd be yeah. nice to give people some time. We're going to need it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, Bennington County Solid Waste Alliance Ordinance mm -hmm. Amendment. This is the second reading of the amendment to the Solid Waste Agreement of the county. Uh, and the only part being changed is Article 7, Registration and Reporting. The line that reads, uh, haulers and facilities shall report on the quantities <coughs> of municipal solid waste, organics, and mandated recyclables collected in the town for each preceding quarter on April 15th, July 15th, October 15th, and January 15th of each year on forms to be provided by the town is being rescinded. Uh, it's duplicate paperwork. All the haulers have to submit all this information to the state. We just make them do it again to send to each of the individual towns who, frankly, I have nothing I can do with that piece of paper anyway. So uh, at our last meeting, we decided that we would like all the both towns and all the towns are going through the same thing of amending this ordinance right now to eliminate that one line because it's just kind of an onerous piece of paperwork for the uh, haulers to provide. And it really serves no purpose to us. All this information goes to the state who then tells us all about it anyway. You know, we get quarterly reports from TAM here that we have to reconcile with the state and send up. So it's just a one more unnecessary step. There's information on the town website if, if, if you want to look at it. and. Uh, call myself or, or uh, Mike Batcher at BCC for more information. Good. Personnel policy revision. Uh, Something around to the board. Uh, in the beginning of the year, there were changes in state law requiring changes in how uh, part time employees would be compensated for sick time and pay time. We have been following this. We only have one part time employee who actually qualifies under this. and. Uh, she was compensated when, when she was sick. Uh, however, we have been working on this kind of in my spare time. So this is it. It's, bare, it's basically the format from VLCT. It upgrades and clarifies legal language that's required to protect the town's positions in case uh, any number of things come up. 
Uh, I know there's a question of at will and all that, but at will is nice. But if you don't have a personnel policy and you fire someone, you are in a world of trouble. You know, no matter what, people have interest in their positions and without clear direction in steps that everyone can understand you're taking, you're opening yourselves up to just a pile of trouble. I think this changes uh, minimal amounts of the language from the prior one. Uh, there was a section added in that I just thought was uh, worthwhile. The one, the one from VLCT, as you go through, it has a, uh, a bereavement section that we don't have in ours now. Uh, that was one of the big changes is the sick, we had sick slash personal time, which is a confusing topic not well defined. It's well defined in here by statute. This is also one of the changes required. So on the recommendations of VLCT, it's now just sick time with a lot of reasons you can use that sick time. And many of those are statutorily required. This, this is an optional. And what we would do with this, if the board uh, approves it, is we would send this back to VLCT with any tweaks we make. They review it legally for free to make sure that we're, we're not on a, in any bind here. But the sick leave has been redefined. The, the bereavement leave of one to three days and list out who you can take it for uh, is it, kind of a standard thing in a lot of places I, I've been to. What, what you run into is towards the end, because we've run on a fiscal year, you get somebody in, in June or, or you know May and this, this comes up. Uh, you know, people need to take a day or two, and if they don't have vacation time, they're on unpaid leave in the midst of already a trauma. It's fortunately it rarely comes up for people, so uh, I don't, I just don't see it as an extraordinary benefit, depending on uh, the close group of people who are defined here. Well, can't they apply for FEML? Is the family emergency no. medical leave? They can't. Uh, that's that is a whole another statutory it's thing, but different. Yeah. bereavement leave is not. Or, or for uh, death, it's not really Family Medical Leave Act. Right, right. Yeah, and Family Medical Leave Act doesn't mean you get paid either. It for means you can take time off. Well, it protects your position from having. Well, that I mean, you know, this is this is more like: Are we going to take the pay from someone who has to go to a funeral for three days, or are we just going to cover it as as, as a benefit? Uh, you know, right now, like I said, you can get caught. I mean, even when, when my mother-in-law died. You know, <coughs> Using, using these sick slash personal days. And that's when it really caught my attention because I hadn't thought about it when, when I started here that way. I've never worked in a place that didn't have a bereavement section of their mm -hmm. personnel policy. So uh, it, it's not a huge thing, but uh, it certainly helps and can be kind of a morale builder if you're losing someone. You no, know you're not chewing into time that's, uh, or you're not gonna get paid because you happen to go on vacation the month before and it's the end of the year. You know? And the night, you know, we allow two years of sick time. We built up, and, and that's not, not too bad, it's, it's, but it's 24 days. Uh, you know, I break my arm and I'm on the road crew. That 24 days is gone in no time. And then they're on our disability, which we'll get to later. And, uh, you know, chipping away at that time. I fully encourage everyone never to take a sick time, sick day or this slash personal day unless you're really sick because, boy, your time runs out. There's nothing we can do for that. And, and we've tried to make that clear because you just cannot be paid sick days you don't have. And everyone would just be doing it. And you can't contribute to the other person's sick time. We don't allow that. So, yeah. Uh, just the possibility, especially, I mean, primarily we're talking about road crew. You know, the possibility of getting, getting uh, hurt and not being able to come to that job. You know, it isn't like if I broke my left arm, I could still come in and write. Or if I break my left arm, I can't do my job over here. And then they'd be out of sick time rapidly. Our current disability is, is frankly kind of a joke. It was set up years ago, so I'm going to look into a new disability plan. It's, uh, it's, you get like $400 a week, which is barely half of a lot of the salaries. And uh, if you have that, unfortunately, we discovered that if you buy the extra AFLAC, AFLAC will pay because we have a disability plan. So AFLAC is actually better than the one we have, which was purchased years ago. 
So, but that's not on this topic. That's another thing coming up. Are you suggesting that we consider changing the cap on sick days? Uh, no, I just would like not to dig into it by having people have to take, uh, you know, two or three days for a bereavement for leave. Okay. Yeah, I don't think we need to up it. Uh, most people are are it's expiring after two years. <coughs> you know, they have their full whatever that turns out to be, 192 hours, and so they're not they're not even turning back hours. So, uh, you know, a lot of them turn back vacation time. Most of the crew doesn't even use all their vacation. So it's just a matter of giving them a little more flexibility so that they don't have to use it. I just don't like the idea of them using sick time when it's, you know, it's pretty minimal. If you're in that kind of position, it's pretty minimal. A couple of sprains and you could burn all your sick time just like that. Well, thank you for staying on top of this. Um, I got a little confused and worried about the uh, the... VLCT's introduction to this, talking about at will employment, uh, but I agree with Dave that uh, uh, we have to have a personnel policy both to protect us, uh, to protect the employees, uh, to make sure you know that we don't get you know a rogue select board in here that just wants to make sure we hire their 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 relatives. Uh, having having a policy in place uh, makes it clear to everybody what the rules are. The only uh, many changes to this, except in the wording, which I think is is better. Just there, there's two designation points in the sexual harassment part and uh, the other part uh, of who should file a complaint with. I'm making it myself first, and then the select board chair, because I can't think of anything who else to put it. So it would either be me. It's the employment harassment and discrimination section it needs two notification points that an employee can go to in the sexual harassment court. So it'll be myself and, and the select board chair. Um, and the rest of it, uh, we'll leave it like this. I'm gonna tidy it up because you'll see VLCTs in some places in the text still. And okay. I'll eliminate all that. And uh, I left in the headers for lost sections just to try and give you a background of why we need to change this. A lot of this is state law driven. Okay. Um, so I will make up a tidy part of this and uh, if there are any changes over the next two weeks or close to three weeks before the next meeting, uh, I can write those in and we can uh, move to adopt this uh, at the November 6th meeting. And then I will uh, send it to VLCT for legal review. Mm -hmm. Here's another part, sick leave. In there is they have sick leave going to elected officials of the town, uh, which is kind of a curious thing because the only person that would apply to it is the town clerk. So, uh, but the town clerk is kind of on a salary anyway. She's not an hourly employee. So she's gonna get the same amount whether she's here or not. So I will delete that uh, because it's kind of a, wide open thing, you leave elected employee in there, elected official in there, so I think I will delete that unless the board wants me to leave it in there. <coughs> I'm sorry, I need to get you to repeat that. I was trying to grab an action sick. item there. Uh, part, of, part of the sick leave and what they have in the VLCT thing is that uh, it's for the employees, what an employee means, an employee or an elected official of the town. So I don't think we really want to leave that word again. The only kind of elected person who's paid here uh, of, of consequence is the town clerk who's on salary, so this doesn't really apply anyway. Uh, to leave it this way kind of means you guys can put it. We were just talking about it. <laughs> Yeah. It, it might take you several years at, at your pay, rate pay <laughs> to, to have one worthwhile, but uh, I think I, sh I should just delete that to make it cleaner. Okay. <laughs> Didn't the state of Vermont uh, do something about uh, sick leave? <laughs> like, like, like where I work, you're only given two days, and they just made an hour and to have three. Yeah, it, the law requires, depending on the size of your operation and everything, uh, different levels you have to comply with. You have the option, and this is an important distinction, you have the option of 
having employees accrue time or giving it up front. If you have them accrue time, they can keep the accrued time past what would be our two years. If we assign it at the beginning of the year, it doesn't accrue. You're given it and just like we do now. Because that's one of the tricky parts of, of the new law. Because the accrual, if it, like we used to accrue here or whatever it was, a day, a month, or what it's to say. Right. You know, now at the end of that two years, well, it just keeps going. So if you give it like we do now, you get your vacation time at the beginning of the year, it doesn't accrue past what we say, which is the two years. You can only bring one over to the next. vacation will accrue, but the, uh, the, the sick time is just, it's, you know, two, well, two days. Now it's three days, but uh, it's use it or lose it. So. Yeah, and then that's, that's, that's the other part. It, you can have it use it or lose it, uh, depending on the size of your company. Uh, we allow the two years accrual. Uh, we could go much higher, but I didn't think we should. The do last that. I knew, I think they were talking about 2018 or maybe it's yes, 2018. It's supposed to go to five days. Yeah, for 2017, yeah. it is when the law went into effect with a certain size company. 2018 it has to be adopted by everybody. Mm -hmm. um, there are those time limits in there, or, or the amount of accrual. Uh, I believe we have for part time is the uh, maximum accrual is 40 hours which for our one part-timer who even qualifies for this would take you know, nearly a year and a half to accrue that much, so. May want to explain to Joe, because our fiscal year are started in the middle of the summer, the poor guys couldn't take vacation yeah. until they'd work a while. This yeah. is why we give it to them yeah. up front. Okay. You understand yeah. what I'm saying? Yes, I do. They, yeah. they, our, their year started June 1st, they couldn't <laughs> take a July vacation because yeah. they hadn't had that many That's right. days. That's right. So. <laughs> yeah, and even even those uh, additional sick and personal days, if you get them at the beginning, I mean, who's to say they're more valuable in June than yeah. if I get sick in September, you know, or my kid gets sick, I want them then, not it's when I'm say, feeling good. I burn them up, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and like I said, the biggest thing I do is encourage everyone not to use any of their sick or personal time because uh, things go wrong, that's capped and we can't do anything about that. So. So if, if anyone sees anything they have a question on over this, over the next two weeks uh, before the 6th, we'll uh, adjust it. But um, I do like this format. Uh, it's very mm -hmm. explanatory. And it covers everything that, of course, the lawyers would like us to cover, which is the right. important part, too. OK, any other business tonight? Um, oh, yeah, just my, uh, about. Four months ago, before uh, we lost a huge chunk of the road crew, the select board approved the purchase of a pickup truck, uh, which I tabled until we got to where we are now, where we're going to have six guys, and we'd like to go forward with that. We found a few acceptable ones nearby, new ones that uh, uh, we think we might be able to get a deal on. You're looking at new. Right. Oh yeah, no, no, because it would be, it would be another uh, redundant vehicle. But we still have nothing but, uh, you know, the Dodge, which is pretty oversized to do simple things with, and it's it's not the best thing to use some of these trucks for to run down to get a part. And even today, uh, Kyle had to go down and get get a tip for for the the welder, and he's driving the one ton down to get a tip for a welder, you know, because that's what was available because the uh, Dodge was out. So we, you know, it's it's more practicality. Now, is there any way that other towns, if they were looking, or maybe you could check with other towns, see if they're looking to buy a truck as well? And if they are, if you could do a collective buy, you might be able to get a fleet price, which is going to be a lot less than. Yeah, it's. You you would need ten or more, right? Every uh, town for, does for this fleet. a little differently, uh, and it would be very tough to to get the right equipment that we need along with these other towns simultaneously. Uh, one uh, very local nearby town uh, just goes down and buys the truck. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no set thing. It's up to the town what they want to do. I've looked at the state uh, You're gonna put prices. It up for bid? And, uh, yeah, we do have to put it up for bid unless we have some kind of uh, extraordinary deal. Mm -hmm. When we bought the Green International, it was a used vehicle. We were kind of in a pinch. It was a great price. We knew its history was there. It was ready, and that's kind of acceptable. You just you just buy it, uh, or we go out to bid like on the pickup truck, 
if there's an exceptional value we can find, it might be something to be looked at. Uh, otherwise, we go out to bid, and you know that's not always the most effective way either. Right. Uh, we wind up with some dealer, you know, uh, miles and miles away because you're going to get Warran warranty work. Yeah, warranty problem. work. I mean, the Dodge goes over to Greenwich every time. You know, I've had to go pick up guys at Greenwich to bring them back. I don't understand that because, you know, the way I always understood it selling cars, the, no matter if, it was, if you sold a Chevrolet to somebody, it was a brand new Chevrolet, let's say I sold it from Pateri's. Yeah. They could go to Morrison's with it and have their warranty work done. I mean, I guess that's the way it's supposed to be done, right? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, well, it was just one well, good thing, thing about it's under the, a manufacturer warranty. Yeah. You should be able to take it to the closest dealer. And well, that's why it, the local Ford the dealer done. is interesting, and, and the Chevy dealer. I mean, it's uh, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I shouldn't say unfortunately, we have a Dodge, mm -hmm. and uh, that's it. It's Greenwich. Wow. So, you got a Dodge dealer at North Street. I was gonna say that's right here in town. Oh, uh, where? North Street, but it's Stevens. Stevens. Stevens, he's not open yet. Yeah, so yeah. you're just. Yeah. Oh, did he, when did he open? He's at Scott's Corner. Yeah, that costs him good well. Yes. Oh, that one, that one, that one. He can't building, service yeah. that truck. He, no. Yeah, that's what that is. I'm sorry, I was sorry, I had the wrong speed <laughs> in my head. Probably it doesn't have a diesel technician. Yeah, there. yeah, I, I, that has come up before. I think there is it. They're building a new one down by Walmart, right? Yes. Right. I think that they have some intention of being able to service. A lot more of their trucks around here, <coughs> but by the time that gets done, I think they do a fall for money or something. I think so. Uh, uh, I know the local Ford dealer can't can't uh, still do a diesel pickup. It has to go yeah to green much. We we are there. off the diesel. I know uh, for, for the pickup truck. Thank you. Yeah, yes. yeah. Uh, that's not not the best way to do it. No, I don't think. I'm, but the, just to come. Yeah, yeah, and that's the problem with with a lot of the dealers when you get into a truck, they just don't do them. A wheel truck with diesel and everything. Yeah. They just don't have the technician. It's not worthwhile for them. You, know, so you have to have it be a bigger setup. So you're just informing us that you're going to proceed with the pickup yes. purchase? And if we get uh, a solid thing, uh, we will bring it back to you. But we, we tabled it, like I said, when so many people left. Didn't want to buy a truck if we were going to be down to, you know, me and Steve. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, anything else? Think, no, I think that might be it. Anyone else have other business? Okay, uh, review of action items. Um, going back to September 19th, we had some questions about uh, how 911 addresses are assigned. Uh, Dave looked up a handful, including the select board addresses, and they were all in the right place. Yeah, they're um, all in the right places. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how you assign a 911 address to a landlocked piece of land up in the mountains with no permanent residence and no cell phone is, uh, is an interesting detail, but not really yeah. a pressing problem. Uh, it's, uh, we, we've gone on to, uh, and Shelly's been helping me out with this, uh, we've gotten on to some towns. Uh, we thought Dummerston had the answer because they told us they did all of theirs, but they have a very specific, you have to have driveways, you have to have markings. So that would make it a lot easier. We're still dealing with people up ATV tracks. Yes. Uh, I'm still working on the I idea because none of this is permanent. Even uh, one gentleman was saying how his is on wheels and he moves it to here there. Uh, I would like to, to taper it off, like just taking Shaftesbury Hollow and Sleepy Hollow, make that Sleepy Hollow West and Sleepy Hollow East, and then the third fork up at the top will have to call something else. But even on the computer, I can measure from Shaftesbury Hollow to the center of the property where it borders one of these roads and assign numbers that way. Uh, it was asked to state, but I don't think they realized what I was saying because they came back with, well, no, it has to be the driveway. And it's like, this is an ATV trail where, you know, maybe he cut in here today. Maybe, you know, it's, no one's getting up there in a fire truck anyway. So <laughs> it's, it's, uh, right, right. But they need a general location. That's why I thought, and I'm going to get back to the state. I thought if you went in the center of the property line along the road and said this is 4,550 mm -hmm. Shaftesbury Hollow West, mm -hmm. that would put you at the property. And you know, it's always going to be a problem finding somebody in the woods on right. 100 acres. Uh, but you're there, 
and if the guy has a cell phone, because no cell phones don't work up there anyway, yeah, there's no home. phone service, so uh, <laughs> we're putting you awfully close. I thought that was a reasonable solution to that. But And then you have the ones over here, off 7A, that also don't all, I mean, they might start off the end of this road, but then they're up these other trails. And it's kind of a confusing thing. Sometimes it's as they don't know, bro. Yeah. But honestly, I, I don't back from the state. That's a kind of a liability thing. I'm not sure how much time we want Dave to spend on working this. If, if you break your leg in the woods, if you get a cell phone signal, you're going to have to describe more than your address. So uh, I don't know that yeah. there's, it's worth a lot yeah. of effort. Uh, well, Shelly is helping a great deal on this, but uh, you know we, we're going to follow it through as best we can. We need Mr. Moffat here once in a while, anyway. So we <laughs> yeah. Give him right. something. To talk right. About. Right. Yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, it's it's an interesting problem. So. Um, Let's see, we were still wondering uh, about the dividing line between Arlington and Bes Bennington Rescue Squads. Or, yeah, uh, uh, the best uh, I got out of that was uh, someone just decided how long it would take to drive an ambulance from this point to that point back, you know, a long time ago. Because Arlington doesn't seem to have any real sense of where it came from either. Uh, there is a line? Oh, yeah. Well... Yeah, there is. There is. It's it, from the chocolate barn through. Uh, uh, must be getting late. Hidden Valley. Thank you, Hidden Valley, and then to a corresponding part on East Road. So there is a okay. line set up. Well, that was the real question. Is yeah. we weren't sure where the dividing line. Where it came from? from yes. Who yeah. knows? But the the other thing, like what was brought up, you know, if you need an ALS unit, one may be available, but you're still going to get what's available. And that's what it all boils down to. You can push that line.